Hi guys. This lighting is so horrible. <laughs> Every time I turn my chair around so I can actually set up instead of it looks like I'm or I'm sitting back in my chair facing the wall the other way. It looks like I'm like people think I'm laying down, but I'm not. I'm just sitting back in my chair. So I try to set up sometimes at the desk. Um but to make for like a different view and different look, I guess. But um, the light is right there beside me. It's got five bulbs in it. Well, four because one blowed. And I forgot to tell Sherman to get a pack of light bulbs. Maybe you can get them tomorrow. But um, I thought he's coughing. Um, Dad, Dad's on his way home. He got you a surprise. But yes, hopefully um, I'm supposed to get my chair tomorrow. It's supposed to be delivered tomorrow, so hopefully I'll, it'll be delivered tomorrow. And then when it is, I'm going to put, um, Sherman's going to put my rainbow poster that I got for my birthday here on the, the back of the wall, um, here on the back of the wall where the chair's going to be, so you guys will have a bright background. So hopefully the videos will look much more better than this. Um, foggy, dim looking videos. But I thought I'd do a story for you guys today out of my Dreams and Miracles book by Ann Spangler, which are true stories that people have sent in, and some Ann, uh, Ann Spangler wrote herself. We're almost done with this book. I didn't say in that, but. We really are. We've only got, like, I don't know how many stories left, but look, that's all we got left to do. So, um, let's go today with today's story. It's called A Dream in Time by Craig Gallick. And as always, I will start off by reading you guys the introduction. Craig grew up in West Mifflin, Pennsylvania. A dyed-in-the-wool baseball fan, he played in the semi-pros until he was 39 and then sponsored a team called the West Mifflin Rebs. He owns a restaurant, which he named after another of his teams, rounding third. He and his wife have two children. In 1987, they had a dream about his father that encouraged him to talk openly about the things that really matter. Now let's get into Craig's story. When I was 30, my folks finally divorced. My father's drinking and womanizing had become too much for my mother to bear. He was an alcoholic who owned his own bar. Eventually, his drinking cost him everything his wife, his children, his home, and his livelihood. I didn't understand how a man could be so irresponsible. For years he had failed to pay the bills because he spent his money on liquor and women. He was nobody's idea of a good father, and I resented him for it. As I got older and became more serious about my faith, I tried to do what little I could to help others. One day it hit me. Every month I was sending a few dollars to India to some needy people I had never met. But I wasn't doing a thing for my dad, who was such a broken down piece of a man. I decided it was time to grow up and get over my bitterness. I needed to forgive him. So I got up the nerve and went to see him. Before long, we had a standing date. Every other week we met at Long John Silver's and shared a fish dinner. Then he started seeing, we started seeing each other every week. The more contact I had with my dad, the more I realized how needy he was. He was always getting beat up, bumming money off people, and being evicted from his apartments. At one of our diner meetings at Long John Silver's, I asked him if he would consider moving in with me if I built two more rooms went to the restaurant. To my surprise, he took me up on it. It took a month to build the rooms, which I furnished with a TV, a VCR, and some nice cots. 
My dad thought it was absolutely the greatest place he had ever lived. He said to me, why did you do this? And I told him I just wanted to make him happy. After that, we became very close. It was great to talk about our mutual love of baseball and the team I owned. Every time I walked into Dad's rooms, he would try to feed me ice cream or grapes or something else from his refrigerator. Gradually, I began to see a different side of him, his generosity and warmth. Despite various barroom brawls, I knew he wouldn't hurt a flea if he could help it. Every Thanksgiving, he had cooked a huge meal for any of his customers who had no place to go, and he was always generous with the poor. Once I let go of my resentments, I began to see my dad in a different light. Shortly after he moved in, I had a dream that really scared me. I saw smoke and total chaos, a place full of ugliness and fear. In the dream, I kept descending into the smoke. Further down and further down, the place seemed bottomless. I knew what I was seeing, and it terrified me. The worst thing about the dream was that it seemed to represent a kind of judgment of my dad. I was so frightened when I woke up that I rushed downstairs, relieved to find him sleeping peacefully. That dream really, <clears throat> really took my prayers and my talks with Dad about God's love and his need for him. Four months after Dad moved in with me, he suffered a fall, and I took him to the hospital. A few days later, the doctor told me Dad had cancer and a weak heart. He might live another three months, but that's all. In fact, my father died of a heart attack that very day. During his brief stay in the hospital, Dad actually did seem to make his peace with God. He received communion and even talked with my two brothers who were reconciled to him before he died. In the funeral home, I knelt before the coffin with my brothers, Stanley Jr. and Dennis. Nobody else was in the room. Despite our problems with Dad, the three of us were heartbroken. As far as we were concerned, he had always been the boss. No matter how often he messed up, we still loved him. His word was always final. Now the boss was dead. As I looked at my dad in the coffin, I couldn't believe what I saw. For a moment, it looked like he was smiling. When we left the room, my older brother Stanley turned to me and said, Did you see that? I hadn't imagined it. Both of us had noted the smile on Dad's face. I couldn't help but think it was God's way of letting us know that he too loved this stubborn old man and that he was watching out for him. I was grateful for that dream even though it had frightened me. It had warned me about Dad's death and about his spiritual condition and its shock of losing him so suddenly, more than it gave me the courage to talk to him about getting right with God before it was too late. I could live my life myself knowing I could not live a life knowing I had done, not done the best I could do as a son for him about telling him about God. I loved him, and I knew the boss loved me. And that was Craig's story, A Dream in Time. I hope you guys enjoyed Craig's story, and I hope you guys have a great holiday weekend. Bye, guys. God bless.